Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by, by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on our website, womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 30,853 people from 158 countries and is supported by 429 organisations. We have over 100 volunteer activists, including 53 country contacts in 53 countries. They're engaged in defending women's rights. This week, we'd like to welcome our newest country contact from Northern Ireland, so welcome. Um, we hold host a range of women from all over the world on Feminist Question Time and our um, uh, other webinar, Radical Feminist Perspectives, and on webinars hosted by our country chapters. All the women who speak on these webinars have signed the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights or have known histories of feminist activism. But beyond that, we don't know their exact views or activism. So we don't know what they're going to say. And uh, the views expressed by the speakers are not necessarily those of WDI, and we don't necessarily support views or actions that speakers have expressed or engaged in at other times. This week, we have Gunda Schumann from Germany, who is going to be talking about 50 years lesbian movements in Germany. We have Francis Schmutz from Germany, who's going to give us an update on what's happening on sex-based rights in Germany. We have Linda Hart from Finland, who is going to talk about the promotion of gender identity politics by the European Union. And we have Victoria from Colombia, who will give us an update on women's rights situation and perspectives during a presidential campaign in Colombia. I'm really, really pleased to introduce our first speaker, who is Gunda Schumann, is a lesbian activist from Las Reloaded, um, which is a, a company, a, a voluntary organisation, and she's a member of the board uh, of Las Reloaded, a lawyer, a sociologist, and an author. In 1972, lesbians joined the Organization of Homosexual Men, HAW, establishing the first lesbian group, HAW uh, Frauen. It was the beginning of a lesbian feminist movement in Germany, making lesbians and their demands for equal rights uh, through spectacular actions visible to the public. Gunda is going to give us a talk and update us on what's happened in the last 50 years. So thank you so much, Gunda, for coming on and over to you. I would talk about 50 years German lesbian movement from the Lesbian Action Center Reloaded, as it calls today, back to the Lesbian Action Center and further back to Women of Homosexual Action West Berlin. The first title I call Her Story, From Women of Homosexual Action Berlin West to Lesbian Action Center, Lutz, Berlin West. Lesbian Action Center West Berlin has emerged from the women's group that was founded in 1972 as part of the Homosexual Action Berlin West, HAW. This women's group declared itself LATS in solidarity with the feminist women's movement. Actions and demands by Lesbian Action Center during the 70s pushed for a more open-minded attitude towards lesbians and women in the following decades by society at large. One spectacular action has been the public protest against a defamatory press coverage of a murder trial against two lesbian women in 1974. The press used the criminal charge against the two women accused of killing the abusive husband to criminalize all lesbians with the following headline, the crimes of lesbian women. After lesbians of HAW entered the courtroom to address the judges, the press coverage read as follows. Judges leave the courtroom to take refuge from lesbians. 
Another activity was a participation in a nationwide TV documentary in 1974 titled And We Take Our Rights in German Und Wir Nehmen Uns Unser Recht. That enlarged the German lesbian movement overnight in a manifold fashion. The founding mothers of this first engaging West German feminist lesbian movement of the 70s came from the leftist anti-authoritarian and anti-capitalist movement of the, of the 60s in which the dominant heteronormative and patriarchal structures of society were not at issue. Originally as women's group of homosexual action Berlin West and later as LAZ, they have been engaged between the years 1972 and till 1982, creating a lot of activities and projects. Here you see LIZ as a spider in the middle and a lot of activities and projects stemming from that organization. Afterwards, the group dissolved. Nevertheless, the women working now in projects or men-dominated jobs and living in communes continued taking advantage through past empowerment by radical lesbian group procedures and experiences. Here you see a karate group. So what happened in the years afterwards? In 2018, there was an exhibition called Radical Lesbian Feminist, a retrospective of the lesbian feminist movement in Germany took place in the Gay Museum in Berlin from 5th of July till 5th of November, 2018. Three former LAZ women organized an exhibition showing a retrospective of LAZ in the Gay Museum. There's a video on the exhibition available. Please order at LAZ if you are interested. The email address is laz.reloaded at gmx.com. A variety of as yet non-published original documents, image and audio material, and last not least, precious treasures of private collections, including records and musical instruments, are showing for the first time engaged forms of resistance, imaginative actions, publications by LAZ, and the abundance of projects that are in part ongoing till today, thereby documenting the pleasure of lesbian life in all its facets. Furthermore, former visions like Lesbian Nation emerged in European lesbian summer camps in celebrating large festivals with the Flying Lesbians, a lesbian rock band. In creative projects like the Lesbian Press, newsletter, but also in self-defense and consciousness raising groups. Afterwards, Lesbian Action Center Reloaded was founded in 2019. Lesbians should be visible and their rights be preserved. That is a message. LAZ is alive and as LUTs reloaded, it desires to get again its own rooms, preferably a lively location open to the public but reserved to women, hoping that it may become a meeting point for lesbians, their numerous activities, their urge for knowledge, their solidarity. LUTs reloaded should be a contact base for radical lesbians the Organization for Lesbian Visibility. Before moving into its own rooms, it will organize events with discussion, lectures, films, cultural topics, and a lesbian feminist generation dialogue at different locations as well as online. In the following, you will find a sample of recent events organized by LUTs Reloaded. One is called Lecture and Talk with Dr. Madeleine Marty, different than the others, a lesbian love story in the 50s. 
The next one talks about Magdalena Kemper, a lesbian feminist journalist, is remembering Giselle Freund, a lesbian Jewish immigrant and photographer whom she met for an interview in Paris, 1989. The situation of lesbian women in China, a Chinese woman is reporting about lesbians in China, lecture and question and answers. Sabine Constable, board member of Sisters Organization, she talked about fight for abolition of prostitution, lecture and talk. This was about the relationship between language and world, a lecture and talk about discriminating language with Ulla Baumann, PhD from the University of Mannheim. Eyewitness report about Filia, Portsmouth and LGB Conference London. One island, two conferences, three lesbians. Then we had online um, Zabit, a detransitioner. Detransition in Germany and internationally, one time, the other sex and back. Get the L out UK lecture and talk with Liane Timmermann from Get the L out in the UK. Gender identity replacing sex, a Trojan horse for women, or an end game for lesbians. That was a lecture last June, I helped by myself. Film, input talk and discussion on international networking with activist and award winner for lesbian visibility, Katharina Oguntoje and the author Carolyn Gammon. The discourse on worldwide feminist positions of the 80s and the 90s. Thank you very much for your attention. Last not least, I would like to draw your attention to a big event organized by Lutz Reloaded at the end of May 2022 in Berlin, celebrating 50 years of German lesbian movement, including workshops, lectures, sightseeing tours, artist performances, music, dancing, networking, and much more. Please watch further details on our website. Thank you. So we're going to hear now from Frances Schmutz. She's the country contact for WDI uh, for Germany and is going to tell us about what's happening in regard to women's sex-based rights um, in Germany. So thank you so much for coming, Frances, and over to you. So um, with the merging of self-ID in Germany, the topic transgenderism is finding more and more space in the media and the general population. Activism also is becoming noticeably louder and more aggressive, trying to silence the growing mass of dissenting voices through censorship and defamation. So I thought I'd start my presentation with a radical feminist demonstration um, held in Berlin. Rap Femme Berlin had called for a demonstration on March 26th in Berlin to protest against all oppression and violence against women. Well secured by the police, the organizers read out the manifesto and invited other women to speak out. About 70 women stood in a circle and listened to the speeches and cheered in approval. Approximately 60 meters away stood the counter demo and tried to disrupt with all kinds of interludes, like a guy with a whistle walking back and forth, vehicles with super noisy mo motors driving up and down the road, or by just shouting their usual slogans and screeching every time we cheered. At one point, uh, a man approached the speakers and tried to pose as a trans woman discriminated by us. He was stopped by women gathering around him and the police led him off. Later, he twittered, I was targeted and attacked by them. They made a sport and spectacle out trying to hurt this woman. They used physicality to try to intimidate me. They were like predators feasting. So he just was stand, standing there. He tried to um, come towards us. I don't know exactly what he wanted to do, but we didn't touch him. Nothing happened. So although at first some women were apprehensive about coming because they had seen scenes of women being assaulted by trans activists, the con concerns had dissipated after making contact with the enemy and we're already looking forward to repeat in the near future. 
Jede Frau ist in ihrer Existenz eine radikale Konfrontation für Männer, dass Männer nur durch Frauen existieren können. Jede Frau ist in ihrer Existenz radikal. Okay, Robert Koch Institute, front holes and urethra lengths, a study on sexual health and HIV, STI and trans and A binary communities by the Robert Koch Institute, the leading biomedical research facility of the German federal government, calls women people with short urethra and their primary sex organs, frontal and pussy. So the text said, People with short urethra are sometimes at higher risk for certain infections, for instance, inflammation of the ur urinary bladder. A short urethra is present in people with, for instance, front hole, vagina, pussy, etc. We are thinking of people still without gender reassignment surgery as well as people after gender reassignment surgery. Are you one of those people who have a short urethra? So on the next day on Twitter, a lively discussion took place under the hashtag Urethra, calling the RKI a pseudo-scientific political activist using misogynistic language, while trans activists got upset over the fact that TERFs and CISs clicked through the questionnaire that wasn't meant for them and were now deliberately sabotaging the results of the study. A Sendung mit der Maus, Indoctrination of the Youngest. The Sendung mit der Maus, it's broadcast with a mouse, is a very popular child's show on German public television, which first aired in 1971. The age of the target group is between four and nine years. Every Sunday, children learn all kinds of interesting facts about a selected topic presented in an easy to understand way. On March 27th, for the upcoming Transgender Day of Visibility, it was explained what being trans means. A man named Eric, whom the children had already met in the previous broadcast as a bearded homeless man, was to tell about his new life in this episode and there would be a big surprise. The big surprise was that Eric now calls himself Katya and claims to be a woman. The children are told that some people are born with wrong sex because they feel like the opposite sex. Then Eric explains that he has always felt different and preferred to do girly things rather than being a strong boy. When he was about 15, he tried on his mother's makeup and clothes and loved it. With skirts, high heels and makeup, Eric now shows the world that he's a woman and the changes in his identity card and birth certificate prove he is a real woman. The next day on Twitter Germany, the hashtag mouse was very active, where many people expressed their anger about the indoctrination attempts of children and the possible cause of damage, and there was a call to complain. In response to the many complaints, the broadcast of EDR explained, transgender is socially relevant. There are children and young people who have a problem with their gender. Then only a few days later on a different channel, the news program Logo, whose target audience is around the age of puberty, had also explained that tra what trans means and that everyone can decide for themselves what sex they belong to. Both programs were not only abs absolutely one-sided, but also encouraging in the presentation, making it seem like being trans was a good thing. Emma, trial still lacking arguments. About two weeks ago, the historic Bayenturm in Cologne, which is protected as a historic monument and houses the edit editorial office of the magazine Emma, was graffitied by trans activists for the second time. Sprayed on the facade is Emma Turfs down the loo 2.0, 2.0, I guess, because it was the second time, signed trans resistance. The removal of the paint is an elaborate process whose costs amount to several thousand euros. Background of the act presumably was the announcement of the recently published book, Transsexuality, What is a Woman, What is a Man, a Polemic, by Alice Schwarzer and Chantal Louise, in which being trans is shown to mainly be a fad 
and that the enactment of self-ID announced by Germany's governing co coalition must be hindered. Various media and organizations call the book Agitation Against Transgender People, and the Lesbian and Gay Association of Germany sees intellectual parallels to the AFD, which is, which is a German right-wing party. Chantal Louise, who's a lesbian, thereon ended her 20-year membership in the Lesbian and Gay Association of Germany. The Civil Rights Association, which once represented interests and concerns of lesbians, gays, and bisexuals, has long since stopped supporting lesbians and calls them transphobes whenever they express their fears towards trans women invading their spaces. Frauenmachtpolitik and the fear of real feminists. On April 2nd in Nuremberg took place the event Women Power Politics of the, German, uh, of the Greens that was advertised in the region as well as online and to which everyone could sign up for free. The special thing about this supposedly all women event was that Markus Ganserer, officially registered as male, identifying as a woman called Tessa and unlawfully seated in the Bundestag per woman's quota, was also one of the speakers. That's him. For the opening discussion where Mr. Ganserer sat on the podium, video excerpts of a uh, documentary was shown of how women in politics were discriminated against by men on the basis of their sex. Then Ganserat talked about human rights being denied to trans people and that there should be no discussion with those who think that one should at least discuss about this topic. This on a feminist discussion day. Accordingly, despite the announcement, no discussion was allowed after Mr. Ganserat's speech. The second discussion continued without Mr. Ganserer, but with the possibility to ask uh, questions at front of the stage. I was, there on that, I was there on that day and I took the opportunity to ask my question, which I would rather have liked to ask at the opening talk. I explained to the speakers that since feminism is a political, a political women's movement, I wanted to know from them because they were both politicians and feminists, or at least participating in a feminist event. What is a woman? Long laughter went through the audience and the speakers also seemed quite amused, but also irritated at the same time, looking around, hoping one of the other women would go first. The first speaker answered, quote, so we're laughing now, we would not immediately know an answer. I find it quite interesting. I'm laughing too, but I cannot answer the question off the cuff. I find it a very interesting question. I don't have a simple answer to it. Um, she was really stuttering and stumbling and her eyes called for help. The second woman jumped in and said, quote, well, maybe I'll just say what comes to my mind. I see gender more from a gender studies perspective, that it's something performative and not necessarily something innate. I think that's something most dreams can probably get behind, at least I hope so. That is, we learn every day what it means to be a woman by how we present ourselves, how we dress, how we speak, how we appear. We show again and again how we, uh, that we are women and get it reflected by society, in which pigeonhole we are sorted. And we react to that again. So it's always this interaction with society, that's how I would try to define it. However, it's a very difficult question to answer, which probably every person answers for themselves, and the question is whether you want to clearly define yourself. Not everyone wants to clearly de define themselves, although society always wants that. Exactly. That would be my spontaneous answer. Then the third woman added, yes, I can only join. I can speak neither as an expert nor as a politician or anything else, but only I personally. And I also believe that ideally everyone should define that for themselves as one feels. When I feel as a woman or also I do not believe I completely independent 
I'm completely independent of what the society perhaps also defines. I think it's very, very hard to free oneself of this, but I think it's a great, I think it's great that the question is asked and I have no bad, better answer to it. There was a lot of stuttering and stumbling of all three women while giving their answers. But one must mention that Ganzara sat in the front row right in front of us. And I had the feeling that there was a lot of pressure and insecurity, at least for the first and last woman because of this. But even the women who studied gender studies seemed to have a hard time. Though they were so amused by the question, it was obvious and saddening how insecure, the, how insecure they were not being able to or being too afraid to def of defining their own sex while being observed by a male identifying as a woman. Then the one who answered last asked back what, uh, why I was interested in this question. I tried to explain that if feminists aren't able to define what a woman is, but that men define themselves as women, feminism destroys itself. A moaning went through the audience while shaking their heads in dis disagreement. The woman who studied gender studies said it was a, misconstructed, a misconstrued interpretation of feminism to put biological born females on one level, but that all people, no matter who, should treat each other equally, followed by a vigorous applause. Then I was asked to let the next speaker step up to the microphone. I gladly did so. The next speaker explained that she was glad to see this kind of event for women existed, but was now very, very nervous to speak after the previous speaker, me, but that it was a very important that it was very important to her to make a statement with regard to the question, what is a woman? And then she gave them the proper definition. A woman is an adult human, adult human female, she said. Five or six women clapped who seem seemingly didn't quite understand what this sentence meant. Everyone else was quiet. A woman is not a feeling, a woman is not a costume, she continued. And then they got it. And once more moaning went through the audience, this time with lots of murmuring. Uh, the gender studies lady said, this was not the right place for this kind of statement and asked her to go back to her seat. While she sat down, the next woman stood up for her rights and silently held up a sign with points showing how self-ID negatively affects on women's rights. A couple of women in the audience jumped up and grabbed her roughly by the arms and pushed her out of the building while she was shouting at them to let go of her. People in the audience were mocking her and calling for the rest to be thrown out as well. A woman at front said, we were not allowed to film during the event and we should stop at once. But up to that point, a lot of women were filming. The woman who gave them the definition left on her own behalf. Another woman right behind me, who seemed to have filmed a lot according to the discussion I got, was kicked out next. The woman sitting next to her nearly got kicked out as well just for having a little chat with her. Then it was my turn for holding wrong opinions. I asked them why. They answered, house law. So I got up, showed them my Posey Parker definition t-shirt and shouted, have fun destroying women's rights, looking into their enraged faces while leaving. So I really would have loved to show you some footage that I made that day, but a lawyer recommended to withhold it because uh, it could cause legal difficulties. Uh, or at least they could bully me with the law, um, which would be aggravating enough and uh, nothing unusual for these guys. So I wrote this as a kind of story. So we're now going to move on to Linda Hart, who is from Finland. Linda is a social researcher working in Finland, working on the topic, topics of political and legal sociology, both for a living and in her free time. Uh, Linda Hart is going to talk give us a brief look at how the concept of gender identity appears in non-discrimination policies and goals of the European Commission, which is the sort of uh, administrative apparatus of the European Union. I'm still recovering from, from what Frances was, was telling all of us. Uh, I've read 
my talk is going to be a bit bit less exciting, but with interesting info and content and things that surprised me when I was digging around. I work as a social researcher, but the policies of the European Commission or the European Union in general are, are not uh, my specialty. So this was kind of like a little extra project. Some time ago, I contacted Joe, if I remember right, saying, asking if there was any kind of pro bono research that could be done for WDI. And uh, yes, then I, uh, then I came up with this, with this uh, short little expose, let's say, of, uh, of the topic uh, desired, which was the promotion of gender identity uh, as an object of non-discrimination by the European Union and focusing on the European Commission and, and its um, recent past and, and planned actions. Generally speaking, uh, treaties of the European Union prohibit sex discrimination in terms of advancing equality between men and women, with the focus being on the functioning of the labour market and in equal access to goods and services. The EU, the European Union, is really an economic community. Um, so or whatever it does, or let's say the at least the kind of more um, traditional understanding of what the European Union does in the field of non-discrimination non and equality law is in order to help the common market function. So goods, services, the free movement of people, um, for example, including same-sex couples within uh, the EU from one member state to another. So in the uh, 2000s, the noughties, the 2000 zeros, uh, several directives, that is EU legislation that member states are then supposed to implement. Several directives have been passed in the area of non-discrimination. So uh, this concerns religion, disability, age, um, equal treatment of men and women. Back then, the vocabulary still was very much like this, sexual orientation. In the EU, there's the European Court of Justice, which interprets EU law, which has given some case law on the protection of gender identity, like as an offshoot of uh, sex discrimination law, as it were. I'm trying to keep it simple. Um, there is also the European Court of Human Rights, which is not an EU institution. It's a separate organization of states, the Council of Europe, but as EU states are all member states of the European, the Council of Europe as well. The main human rights norms tend to come from the European Court of Human Rights when it interprets the European Convention on Human Rights. But basically, um, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, already a few years ago, has recognized gender identity as an object of of protection, but this relates mostly to legal gender recognition. And for example, in Finland, there's a self-ID law drafted and being, being pushed by the government, but it's been perplexing to see all the NGOs, not just the rainbow NGOs, as it were, but also women's and children's NGO, pushing a very similar rhetoric of, oh, this is all required by international human rights. And then they never mentioned that the European Court of Human Rights only uh, requires, uh, the European Court of Human Rights does not require self-ID. Um, <clears throat> but let's say um, gender identity is pretty much an object, a bone of contention in many ways, and it resides more in the larger plans and hasn't been approved as an object of protection by, let's say, all EU member states. But there really has been more and more emphasis to promote the inclusion of gender identity under the umbrella of non-discrimination more generally. But in many ways, this can also happen through different sets of policies and guidelines and recommendations, that is soft law instead of hard law. Um, there are two colleagues of mine, scholars from Central and Eastern Europe, Esther Kovacs and Elena Zaharenko, who, who um, 
wrote a peer-reviewed article which came out late last year. It was very good. They have analyzed the changing meanings attributed to gender in EU policy documents. They conclude that there has indeed been a shift where this term is increasingly being used in the context of individual identities instead of the social structure of gender in society. Um, some context, is it, in some contexts, it's used as an exact synonym for sex, i.e. the physical reality of humans being divided into female and male individuals. Um, and this is very much in contrast with the kind of um, understanding that gender is a historical or social and analytical cat category, um, even just from a kind of a scholarly point of view without particular, for example, radical feminist or gender critical perspectives into it. And Kovats and Zaharenko argue that this shift in the meaning, meanings attributed to gender uh, in EU policy documents does lend some credence to the kind of uh, right wing and conservative criticism that there is of gender, politi gender politics. But this is really, really because to a lot of the lay public, let's say, um, feminism is just one big monolith and they, they might not recognize that there are uh, different factions or different movements within feminism that might disagree with each other. But this brings us to the, um, to the rubric of so-called anti-gender movements. So Poland have been grouped under the rubric of anti-gender movements in, certain, uh, in, in many contexts due to, due to the right-wing um, politicians in power that have then also very, in rather ruthless ways, um, mobilized against um, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and, and both, both women's liberation and, um, and let's say LGBT politics. One of the main problems is that under this label, it's never really easy to know what the interlocutor is arguing for. Let's say once again, recently in Finland, um, I, I've heard a kind of a queer theorist say that uh, this anti-gender movement includes um, feminists, uh, includes actors who call themselves feminists. So this is avoiding to say, uh, this way they can avoid to say the word radical feminist, or they can avoid to say gender critical. They're just saying, oh, these aren't real feminists who say that sex matters. Uh, but let's say in its more uh, usual meaning, anti-gender movements or anti-gender networks refer to, let's say, um, our, our known opponents from, from many years back, the Vatican or right-wing populism um, or religious conservatism. Um, so it's, it's good to pay attention to this, that if someone is talking about anti-gender movements and it's, it's often a kind of mobilization against where do all these, uh, all these different and networked and intersecting movements get their funding from uh, and what are they arguing for. But for example, we know very well that uh, the Vatican or right-wing populists um, often, often argue against abortion, but then again, um, feminists tend not to argue against abortion to try and cut it quite simple. But I would say that sometimes there is a, there is a desire to map anyone saying no to, let's say the current form of gender identity politics as somehow reactionary or, or right wing. Well, I suppose anyone on social media has, has heard all this claptrap already. But yeah, like I mentioned earlier, internal disagreements within feminism are not always recognized by the larger public. Um, in this context, for, for example, uh, in, in right-wing populism, gender may be taken in a very simplistic manner as, a, um, as, a, as an identity category in which one can choose one's gender. And um, mobilizing against this can be a very kind of attention grabbing political phenomenon. And this happens in other countries, not just in Hungary and Poland, which are 
which are kind of more famous for this. So in a shift from a kind of a structural understanding of gender to individualized experiences of gender identity, the focus moves from wide scale power relations to individual expressions. Um, what might be the focus of feminist efforts then? Is it socioeconomic realities in the labor market? And for example, informal care work or cultural and social categories? Um, well, seeing the categories of woman and man as immaterial identities kind of paves the way to, to how a variety of identity labels have been created and multiplied in the LGBT, I'd like to call them subcultures during the past couple of decades. So perhaps genderqueer, non-binary, agender. For example, genderqueer and non-binary, uh, to my understanding, uh, come from perhaps um, the kind of queer zine culture of the 1990s in the United States and then have kind of been disseminated around the world uh, with the help of the internet in, in many ways and, and these kind of uh, rainbow subcultures. But really, then if we look at the kind of actual documents of the European Commission available online, there, there were a couple of uh, surprises in stock there. Um, recent key documents do summarize what is going on in the gender identity policies of the European Commission. And, and quite honestly, I was surprised at how captured the language was in many ways. And you could see that there in many ways might be a shift going on as some, some people, let's say, writing the body of the report of what's been done in recent years, still say something like same sex couples, but then the preface may hold uh, same gender couples. So first, the final report uh, from 2015 to 2019 on the list of actions to advance LGBTI equality. It lays out actions and developments during the past few years. And most of the vocabulary is pretty much the point. There was a lot of emphasis of um, same-sex marriage as a social and legal phenomenon. But an interesting discrepancy, as in a celebratory preface, in this document, Helena Dalli, the Commissioner for Equality uh, from 2019 to 2024, so she'll be in her job for a few more years, uh, the term used for lesbian, gay and some bisexual relationships is same gender couples, even though the main body of the text talks about same sex couples and same sex relations. Um, and in this and in other documents, there are signs of kind of shying away from talking about sex as a coherent and meaningful, meaningful category. Um, and I suppose this is due to uh, the, the people working in the, the European Commission wanting to communicate an awareness of the kind of social and political trends by using this kind of new inclusive vocabulary. Um, but really what was most interesting and surprising then was another document, the LGBTIQ, note the added Q, strategy 2020 to 2025. It talks about lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, non-binary, intersex and queer people, as well as of the legal recognition of same gender couples. And the list repeated when talking about non-discrimination takes the form of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics, echoing very much uh, the Yogyakarta principles, a non-binding document drafted by experts in international law on sexual orientation and gender identity in 2007. The Yogyakarta principles, well, there's also a later document from, is it 2017? Um, but the latter one being perhaps not as influential as the first one. The Yogyakarta principles has received a, um, has been used a lot in lobbying efforts and, and it's been perplexing to see that it has almost received the aura of some kind of um, existing 
existing norms in international law when in in the first place it was really just an a kind of an exercise by these experts of reinterpreting the existing norms so that they would take into account sexual orientation and and gender identity and uh, some of us might have heard that one of the, at least one of the signatories uh, Robert Wintermute a professor uh, a professor professor of law um, has since then stepped back from endorsing it and I must say that when I was a student back then I couldn't kind of see how detrimental it would become to women's rights um, and, and Wintermute's uh, critique is pretty much the same. Um, the need to be the need to be able to be open about all these characteristics is kind of called for in the LGBTIQ strategy of the European Commission. Um, at the same time, placing having a life partner of the same sex to a similar position as what kind of sex characteristics one has, and this is kind of feels like a uh, like it's not not in in balance really. The object of protection from discrimination becomes further muddled when the strategy mentions that, quote, the Commission is examining how non-binary, intersex and queer people can be better protected against discrimination, as all of these are quite difficult to define, with intersex being perhaps the most kind of easily and empirically definable term as it refers to um, uh, differences in sex development. But what does non-binary or what does queer really mean as an object of non-discrimination? Uh, and, and it proceeds to saying things like, quote, trans, non-binary and intersex people are often not recognized in law, law or in practice, resulting in legal difficulties for both their private and family life, including cross-border situations. So this would refer to perhaps a couple moving from one EU member state to another. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, in the case of transgender persons, a discrepancy between outer appearance and identification documents can, is very much possible. Um, however, tra transgender persons, non-binary persons, intersex persons tend to have illegal sex. In some EU member states, um, a kind of a third legal category of sex is possible to have that in your passport, uh, but it's still rather rare. And in and in some of these countries, it is uh, reserved for um, people with DSD. So it's not just a category that you can opt into subjectively um, or identify into subjectively. Um, but really, what most surprised me as, as I've been following the Finnish self ID project of the government quite closely recently, where let's say they are the, not the government, but the, the NGOs and the activists are asking for self ID from people aged 15 and over. And the government says that it should be for uh, 18 and over. I couldn't really believe my eyes when I read from this action plan of the European Commission that, quote, the Commission will foster best practice exchanges between member states on how to put in place accessible legal gender recognition legislation and procedures based on the principle of self-determination and without age restrictions. <laughs> I don't know whether one should interpret it uh, as, as the devil's advocate, meaning that, okay, does the European Commission really endorse um, that toddlers or preschoolers could, could change their legal sex? This is possible in some countries. Norway is not an, not an EU member state, but um, from there, it, it's possible from the age of six uh, with, with some restrictions, I think, like uh, parental approval. <laughs> Um, surprise, surprise. Um, but <laughs> referring to what different kinds of human rights bodies on on the UN level in the United Nations, as as well as uh, other other similar bodies uh, giving out statements on on 
self-ID in the context of law and human rights. I think this reflects a wider lack of awareness of child and adolescent development in the legal and political fields and to some extent in international human rights law. Um, and it is really quite perplexing because in, in designing legal change, um, many different kinds of expertise should be um, made use of. But it seems like it is the fingerprint of various uh, transgender lobbyists uh, can then be seen on this document with both the language of the LGBTIQ and so on, and with this very sweeping broad idea of self-ID with no age restrictions. Um, furthermore, the European Commission shows little awareness of the sensitive nature of gathering data relating to sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics, if we want to talk in, in the language of, of the Yogyakarta principles, as it vows, for example, to quote, improve the inclusion of trans non-binary and intersex people in relevant documentation, applications, surveys, and processes, unquote. Um, my interpretation is that this could very well be in breach of different kinds of data protection principles as um, gender identity, um, in the way it is usually understood, in the same way as sexual orientation is often regarded as private and sensitive information and should not be um, included in different kinds of registers. Um, anonymous surveys would be, would be a different thing. Um, and actually a colleague pointed, uh, pointed a document out to me which relates to this as um, perhaps as, as the last theme we could cover here um, it is equal pay, which is, um, let's say, very much a structural society-wide issue that affects women, um, women in society. So an obscured understanding of the term woman regarding, for example, the gender pay gap, pay gap in this action plan of the commission. The commission says, um, the commission will continue to support measures under the gender equality strategy intended to improve the socioeconomic position of women, including those that are relevant for LBTIQ women. So anyone could be a woman except for the G. Um, but very recently, there's been um, a, a document uh, processed called um, the draft European Parliament legislative resolution on equal pay. Well, to, simpli to simplify the title. And there it says that uh, um, since the 1950s, which is when the original treaty for the functioning of the European Union dates from, um, there have been social and legal changes, okay, as well as research in the medical and biological fields, mm -hmm, which have led to the recognition in the definition of sex, of diversity in addition to women and men, okay. So, for example, in some member states, it is currently possible for persons to legally register themselves as having a third of to neutral gender. This is text from the draft legislative resolution. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, yes, in, in some EU member states, it is possible to have a third legal gender. Um, in, the, in view of the purpose and the nature of the rights, which the principle of equal treatment seeks to safeguard, it also applies to discrimination arising from the person's gender identity. Fine. But in the same document, in the following paragraph, it says that an employer should only mention workers who do not identify as either female or male in their pay reporting obligations, where those workers are legally registered as not identifying as female or male. So self-identifying as, for example, non-binary does not fit into this. Or where that information has been proactively and voluntarily disclosed to the employer. And this raises more questions of in which 
context, this would be relevant um, as having a legal gender marker is uh, much more robust and um, having a third legal gender marker is much more, more of a robust existing undisputed thing than um, personal self-identification. But the main point being that this is um, private and sensitive uh, information, the way a person identifies when it comes to gender under this new understanding, new individualized understanding of, of gender. Um, and, and this um, is, is in line with uh, how the law stands, for example, in Finland, where the Act on Equality between Women and Men was amended in 2015 uh, to include gender identity and uh, gender expression. But it is unfortunately uh, not very well known that um, gender identity is then this kind of private and sensitive information that you're not supposed to ask, do you identify as non-binary, for example, when applying for, for a job? Um, or, or let's say the potential employer is not um, allowed to ask something like that uh, from a potential employee, but we still see a lot of these kinds of forms, both online and, and offline. Linda, but, Linda we're going yeah. to have to finish up in a couple yeah. of minutes. I, I just, yeah, thank yeah. you very much. I'm just coming to kind of my final point, um, which is that I understand that as the, when we look at what the Women's Declaration says and kind of what our shared goals are, I know that um, I'm very well aware that in the international arena, um, um, there is a rather strong push to um, not to not accept gender identity as a legal category at all. And I'm fine with that. But I want to point this out as a kind of a, a secondhand strategy that in um, those Jewish jurisdictions or contexts where some kind of a third legal category of gender, of legal gender is uh, already in place or exists. This, this, is an in, this is an important thing to remind everyone about that it is private and sensitive information and it should not be used um, in parallel to or in the same way as legal sex, which is uh, still very much male and female in most, most contexts and jurisdictions. So we're going to now go to our next speaker, who is Victoria from Colombia. Uh, Victoria is going to update us on women's rights and situation and perspectives during a presidential campaign in Colombia. She's an abolitionist, historian and legal translator, studied an MA in cultural studies, migrated to Ecuador and currently living in Quito. Uh, she is the contact, the country contact for Women's Declaration International for Colombia. So thank you so much, uh, Victoria, for coming. And I'm going to hand over to you. I'll talk about what the, the transgender activism has achieved uh, lately. Uh, the Constitution, the Constitutional Court has um, has uh, enabled the T for referring to sex in the identity do documents, and this was such a big news. And uh, well, radical feminists were, were uh, very outraged because we have very uh, big problems regarding human uh, women's rights, uh, such as uh, uh, trafficking in the border. The, the problem of trafficking in the border uh, of Venezuela is very bad. There are thousands, hundreds of women being trafficked and prostituted in Cucuta and there are no news talking about it, but the news talk about this transgender achievement. This is the first Colombian with the T of trans in his identity card. Now, this was a, a decision of the uh, Constitutional Court. This is a woman who uh, mutilated herself, most for sure. It's, in the statistics of uh, employment in Colombia. And they are also counting uh, webcam prostitution as legitimate work. And uh, we also have uh, um, surrogacy in, in full uh, functioning. We have 
because the, the situation of many poor women, many marginalized women is so bad that this is becoming normalized. Uh, webcam prostitution, prostitution itself and uh, surrogacy. And uh, these days, this was in, inadverted. They didn't say this anything because there was this, this gang of robbers that used acid, through acid to people to rob them. And they were trans. No, they were just men dressing up as women and uh, using that to get close to people in the street and throwing acid to rob them. This was something that went and nobody said anything, nobody did the connection, nothing. And uh, well, this is the situation of transgenderism. Um, also, we see a rise in violence against women in, in the cultural, uh, or, or, the, or at least the, 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 the women are speaking out more about this violence that we are living in, in, in music bands, in the cultural, um, in the cultural environment. And we have this, for example, this news is about uh, some guy uh, of, a, of a my famous band that gave her, uh, his girlfriend, gave uh, an uh, abortion pill uh, without, her, um, without her consent in a juice. And she did uh, uh, indeed uh, abort. She had an abortion she didn't have. And he was um, acquitted because, well, the justice doesn't work for us. And the same constitutional court has, uh, has uh, even um, legitimated the, um, the prostitution legally in, in context with, with sentences that uh, admit as legitimate a, um, a work contract with the object of prostitution. You know, and that, but that was for only one case. And that's one uh, sentence that trans activists use to, to say that uh, sex work is work and uh, that is legally in the, that's, that is legal and that we should support, we should support it. And well, this is the guy, this is just one example of the violence that musicians and bands and that environment, cultural music, entails for women. This woman, uh, there, is, uh, there has been more denounces about uh, violence and abuses from musicians. That's, that's a lot to say. In, this is to, just to show how normalized violence and prostitution uh, in, are in Colombia. Well, and then I would like to, to tell you that Radical feminism is a dangerous position in Colombia. We cannot hold it publicly. It's dangerous. On March 8, uh, radical feminism cannot go out. We are afraid to go out because we are afraid of physical violence. And this is very generalized, but I am uh, really hopeful of younger generations, younger women that are not just swallowing the Kool-Aid. And well, I have this, we are, we are in a presidential campaign you now. And this woman is the most, um, the most possible vice president. She um, ran as a pre-candidate for the presidency. She is a black woman, a, a victim of forced displacement from, uh, a very small town in, in the Cauca. She won the Goldman Award, the Goldman Prize. Uh, I understand this is like the Nobel Prize. This is why she became famous. She won this prize, this award uh, in I think 2018 uh, because uh, of her defense of territory and water. Now she is this popular grassroots black woman that in, in such a short, short time gained a lot of support from the people, from the bases, from the grassroots. And she is now um, the most possible vice president of Colombia. Now, the bad thing with this is this, that 
despite her life experience, she is uh, adopting the discourse of inclusivity. They have the, she is the vice president of Gustavo Petro, who is the, the president candidate that is the less worst, is the, well, we need in Colombia to get the fascism, the fascism out of government, you know? But uh, they have as a model, the Ministry of Equity El Ministerio de Igualdad in Spain. So they have been like having this model uh, in Spain, they, they, I know that if not them, their advisors and the people surrounding them are pushing for the trans law in a similar way that they are uh, doing in Spain. You know, and they are, and uh, even once Francia, Francia Marquez, that's her name, um, she she said in a tweet that uh, sex work should be regulated. No, and, and we know this is like an inherited uh, easy uh, position that her uh, quote feminist movement, Estamos Listas, that, that, that she was a part of. Estamos Listas was this feminist movement that supported her as a president candidate, as a presidential candidate, and, and didn't get any positions in the in the Congress. But they were like uh, this uh, easy position, inclusive diversity position that said that trans women are women and sex work is work. You know? And we are pushing because she's also a victim. We uh, still believe that she can she can understand, she can reason and understand that these are not identities, these are not uh, work, this sex work is not work, that prostitution is exploitation. But we are afraid that when this government comes to power, comes in office, well, they are going to impose these uh, liberal inclusivity politics. Um, well, um, even opening the official account of the WDI in Colombia uh, is is dangerous. For us. I'm not in Colombia, so I'm not in the, in that danger so much. But well, the the ones who are there are, are afraid to talk about that, are ostracized because of our views, and we not can, we cannot publicly uh, state our views and. Uh, and uh, well, we were affected too. I want to talk about the effects of the um, of the forum that caused a lot of controversy, and even uh, um, this organization, Revista Volcanicas. This um, they have a web page. They have this magazine. It made a video like talking shit about it. You know, this has made a lot of. Uh, of uh, incidents and uh, they are like behaving completely as a cult. So we are worried, but um, we are uh, a little, we have a little hope that more and more people come out, come up, come and speak out and reason a little more. And uh, well, is the trafficking situation in Colombia is very troubling because we are we are at war. This is a country at war, Colombia, and um, women are being uh, used as a war a good. We are being trafficked and violated and killed. And this is becoming very normalized even more than before. We have uh, in Colombia, this association of prostitution survivors. And they recently uh, handed the, the report to the HEP. HEP is the uh, Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz, the uh, Peace Jurisdiction for Transitional Justice. Now we are supposedly ending um, a war 
and we needed this model of just uh, transitional justice. They handed uh, this report and they are pushing, they are asking this jurisdiction to open a special case for violence and, um, and sexual exploit exploitation. And uh, those, this, this is a very hard to accept. They just, um, I don't think they're gonna open the case, then they are denied. And the CPI uh, closed the investigation for this uh, very exact uh, exploitation. And the HEP is also refusing to open it till now. No, they don't, they don't want to see a sexual exploitation as a specific issue to, to approach. Uh, but uh, instead they just see like violence from the guerrilla, violence from the paramilitary, from violence from the state. They don't, they, but they didn't, uh, to my knowledge, open this case. Uh, for sexual exploitation to the normalized prostitution. In the institution, in the legal institution, the idea that, that prostitution is still, is not violence, is still very, very entrenched. So yeah. we are expecting that to change.